All right, we're going to get uh, we're going to get started here tonight, and begin our first session here in Daniel. As we go through Daniel, um, I think there's a lot of prophecy here that we'll get into, uh, especially towards the latter part of Daniel, and, and I think it's an exciting book. I think there's so much here uh, that is so rich. Uh, you basically will see. Uh, a little bit of a spin-off from the prophecy seminars that we did last summer. Uh, how many were part of the summer Bible study last year? Okay, so pretty good uh, number here have a background with that information. We didn't study Revelation per se last summer. We just really got into prophecy. We went different places. We did a little bit of study in Daniel. This study this summer is going to be dedicated just for Daniel. And so Every one of the 10 weeks will be part of Daniel and will progress right on through the book. So that is, our, that is our plan as we go through. Well, it's good to have you here tonight. I was, uh, personally, I was hoping for 30 people. <laughs> and we have a few more than that, which is great, which is great. Um, there was question about whether or not we should move to the auditorium, but hopefully we can get everybody in here and and uh, we can get enough tables set up that uh, it'll work out uh, through the summer. I know uh, last year we had some people going on vacation different weeks, which is normal during the summer. And so um, we pretty much were steady, but, but there was some fluctuation uh, in that. So if you're looking for a seat, we have three down here. There's one there. There's one over here. Um, there's one over here. There's no more five together. <laughs> These three are open. Nobody wants to stand or sit right in front of the speaker. I mean, that's like the worst spot you can possibly be at, right? So, yeah, they, 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 there you go. We have a taker here from Texas. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Girl from Texas. That's right. And her that's cowboy right. husband's here. Right. Lone Star Dad. Lone Star Dad, oh boy. Hopefully you've picked up, uh, did everyone pick up a, a syllabus and a map? You should have a, a syllabus and a map. We're out of them? We're out of them. How many we make? All right. We, uh, if, if you want to share your book tonight, we'll have the rest of them for you next week. But if I, just raise your hand if a couple wants to share tonight, just kind of look on. Do we have uh, maps up there? There are extra maps left. We can make some. How many need a map? You don't have a map. A few people need a map. Okay. Um, we can make some, we'll make some more maps. We made 80 copies. Uh, part of the problem is that uh, I think some people that are coming next week picked them up as well. So probably, probably a few went out the door. <laughs> All right. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. And uh, we'll get diving in here to chapter 1 and mix up some, uh, some interesting passages here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have today uh, to be able to study this amazing revelation that you gave to your servant Daniel uh, so long ago. And Father, how amazing it is when we think back to, to the fact that this is a, you know, a long time ago, but it's yet so relevant to us today. Uh, how we thank you, Father, for the prophecy that you uh, gave to us as human beings, Lord. Help us to understand it, Father. We know that there's some passages in here that, that uh, even Daniel himself didn't understand and he asked for clarity on. Father, help us to understand what we can understand, and help us, Father, to be able to benefit from it as we apply it to our lives in a practical manner. So I just pray, Father, that you'd bless each one of the folks that is here tonight. Help us, Lord, to be able to, to make it out uh, as many weeks as possible so that uh, we can glean as much information as we can possibly get. So we thank you, Father, for the blessings that you'll pour out on us, and we ask your blessing on each one tonight. In Christ's name, amen. As you can see, we are taping these uh, on DVD. 
Uh, last summer, we gave out between four and 500 DVDs. And so there will be a DVD for every single week, and you can pick those up. Uh, they're free of charge. That's amazing. Um, and so uh, you can just uh, get those if you miss a week. So we expect people during the summer will miss weeks because of vacations, and you all deserve your vacation. So go and be happy. Um, but uh, when you come back, you can pick that DVD up and you can stay current. So that's an important, um, an important aspect. We're going to get started here uh, in session one with an introduction to Daniel. And my challenge here as a teacher is to be able to, to take, as we try to do this entire scope of Daniel, is to be able to look at the historical aspects of Daniel and make those aspects exciting for you. Because if you've ever been in a dry history class, it's not a lot of fun. But I personally feel like history can be exciting, especially when it's revealed from God's Word. And so that's how we're going to approach this. By the time we get to the latter six chapters of Daniel, we'll be into prophecy and it'll be up over your ears. This is an exciting book. We're going to deal with uh, some things that are really, really important. We're going to talk about the Antichrist a lot, okay? There's a lot about the Antichrist. He pops up there in chapter 11, verse 36, and uh, we begin that whole ride there uh, through that. And then we get into chapter 12. There's some amazing things in chapter 12. There's some dates. There's some days. You're trying to figure all those things out, and it's exciting. So I'm looking forward to it. There's some, some major battles. There's some major players that will be talked about. So a lot of really good uh, exciting things. But one of the things that we're going to look at tonight is some of the history uh, that is going on. And one of the things that stands out to me as I have uh, been able to take a look at, for, for instance, some of the visions that Daniel is, is given and the other dreams that he's been asked to interpret, what I'm amazed at is how short Daniel is in its time frame. I'm amazed that when God begins to talk about these world kingdoms, he talks about these world kingdoms, and there's only a handful of them. And you look at it from the standpoint of how easy it is for us to get to the point in our daily routine where we're living life, and we think this world's just going to keep on rolling. Isn't that the, the, the norm for us? Uh, this is all we know. We just think, well, it's just going to keep right on rolling. It's always going to be the way it is. And yet when you look at Daniel and you start studying these kingdoms, what stands out to me is the fact that the world's really pretty compact in its time frame. And I'm looking at this, and as we get into these futuristic aspects of Daniel when he's receiving these revelations, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, wow, I mean, this is compact. I think God is really going to come soon. And there's some interesting things uh, that'll pop off. This Sunday morning, just a little plug here, we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which talks about the Antichrist. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Antichrist, we're going to talk about uh, the rapture, we're going to talk about what the signs are that uh, Paul points out to the Thessalonican Christians about how they can be sure that the day of the Lord has not taken place yet. And so you won't want to miss that as we get into that. If you're not here this Sunday, pick up uh, one of the DVDs or you can YouTube it now. Did you know that? You can YouTube it. Um, I haven't even done that myself, but you can do it. Uh, actually, I know I've done it a couple of times. And it, and it really is great. Uh, Joe did a great job. Thank you, Joe. Um, that's been awesome. Um, you can go on that way, and you can see the, the whole DVD thing, and we'll have these again for tonight. Notice with me here, as we think about history and we think about Daniel, the, the book of Daniel takes place at a very difficult time in the history of Israel. If you look at verse 1 there, you see, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. So you have right in the very beginning here uh, the besieging of Jerusalem taking place. God's people at this point in time in history are unfaithful, and they're being judged in stages. And God is going to use the nation of Babylon to carry out his purposes. Now, when you start to talk about world empires, how many are confused by some of these different world empires? We think of Assyria and Babylon and trying to keep it all straight. What we're going to try to do as we go through this is give it to you so that it's, it's somewhat easy to comprehend, so that you'll have it in the back of your mind and you'll be able to say, yeah, I, I do get it, okay? That is a, a goal. Some folks are looking for chairs. I have one chair here and I have one chair there, and you could actually pull up a metal chair if you wanted to both sit together over there. So, 
there are um, a couple of things here, if, if you would pay attention to your notes, the time of the captivities. Uh, as we know, Israel is broken in half. There's a northern kingdom and there's a southern kingdom. And you have um, just two tribes that are part of, of the southern kingdom. But the northern kingdom is going to be carried off into captivity uh, in 722 B.C. when Samaria falls to the Assyrians. And that takes place there. You can look up 2 Kings, and uh, we're not going to take the time to look up 2 Kings here tonight, but you can read about that as that happens. When you think of Samaria, you think of all of those wicked kings uh, that reigned there during that time period. The Assyrians are an interesting bunch. They're absolutely brutal. They are absolutely brutal people. What is the capital of Assyria? Nineveh, exactly. And we think of who when we think of Nineveh? Jonah, remember? Jonah went to Nineveh, and he's going to Nineveh, and he's there to, to, to preach repentance to these people. And they are, as I said, brutal. There's all kinds of artwork that's available for you to look at with regard to Assyria, um, just taking the skin off of their captives, you know, nice things like that. Um, can, you can imagine having that hanging on your wall. Wonderful, right? Um, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty brutal what they were doing. And they are the ones who carry away the northern kingdom. Southern kingdom, though, is going to be judged by the Babylonians. And in 586 B.C., if you were in Bible college, they would tell you that is one of the key dates you're supposed to remember because that's when Jerusalem is destroyed. It is uh, marking the fall of Jerusalem, and it begins to become then a province of Babylon. A couple significant events, 597 B.C., during the reign of Jehoiachin, 10,000 people are carried off to Babylon. In 605 B.C., Daniel's taken from Jerusalem with his three friends. And along with some other young Jewish men, uh, they're carried off to uh, Nebuchadnezzar's palace. Now, it's noteworthy that Daniel was in Babylon for eight years when the people of the captivity had arrived then in 597. So if you look at the date above, and you say, oh, okay, Daniel's there. And remember, B.C. works backwards, right? So 605 is older than 597. And so when you look at that, you realize he's been there for eight years when these other people arrive, and 19 years when the group from 586 B.C. came. By the time the people of Israel are able to go back to the land, Daniel's too old to be able to do that. I want to just point out something as we go through um, this book of Daniel that hopefully will resonate with you as you understand the significance of this revelation. In the Bible, in the biblical periods, there are four great times where you see miraculous things happening in the world. Uh, miracles are not commonplace. And so it's important for us to note that when Moses comes on the scene and he's throwing his staff down and it's becoming a snake or he's touching with his rod the, the Dead Sea or the Red Sea and it's opening up and the people of Israel are passing over, you realize that these are tremendous miracles that the people beforehand really hadn't seen. And so these times of miracles, these times of God uh, really uh, coming to the people were unique. The second thing that you see uh, with regard to miracles that take place is really Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha, that's a great time of miracle working. And uh, we could go through and some of the amazing things uh, that God did. Um, and there's some, there's some fun stories there that uh, you just look at and you say, wow, isn't God amazing with Elijah and Elisha? And then you got to love how Elijah goes to heaven, right? I mean, that's just amazing too. So you, you have these times. Now, interspersed, you do have some miracles, but these are major concentrated times where there's a lot of new things that are happening. When you come to Daniel, it's really the third point where you have some really amazing things happen. And Daniel is receiving this revelation from God He's interpreting these dreams. You have Daniel in the lion's den, miracle. You have Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And so you have these miracles that are taking place during this period of time. And it's, and it's exceptional. It's really exceptional. So it gets our attention as we begin to go through Daniel. We start sitting there thinking to ourselves, whoa, these are really neat that these miracles are taking place. And you look at it from the standpoint of, okay, what follows those miracles is this amazing revelation where the angel of the Lord is actually coming to Daniel and giving him new revelation. So that's, that's pretty, um, pretty exciting. 
And then, of course, we have Christ in his first coming. We have a whole nother set of miracles and uh, the miraculous birth, the virgin birth of Jesus. And then we follow that through with all the miracles leading up to the time of the resurrection. And then that carries into the church age with the sign gifts that are prevalent uh, during the early time of the church. And we read about all of those things that are happening there in the book of Acts. I think the next thing that's going to happen, the, the fifth one, if you want to write down number five, is really the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is, um, we don't know exactly when that's going to take place, but the rapture of the church will begin uh, that time period of the day of the Lord, and that will be in an exceptional time as well. So each one of these time periods, God is doing something really special among men. And the giving of this new revelation really does not want to be overlooked by us. Purposes to writing this book. Well, there's a lot of them, and I, I just have a few of them. Uh, so if you have a study Bible and it lists maybe some different uh, purposes, I don't argue with that. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of purposes. There really is. One is to introduce Jehovah to the pagan nations. I, I, think, I think that was uh, uh, part of it. To reaffirm the fact that God's promises to Israel were not suspended. Remember the covenants that God made with Israel? Uh, all of a sudden Israel find itself in captivity. And I think going through the Jewish mind is, I don't think God's going to fulfill what he said he was going to do. Because maybe we were sinful and there's no chance for us to be able to be repentant now. We're hundreds and hundreds of miles away from home. Uh, Jerusalem's been sacked. All of the holy uh, sacred items in the temple have been carried off. I mean, it was a very depressing time. So all of a sudden you have this new revelation, and part of the revelation is God saying to the people, I'm not done with you yet. Uh, there's still a major future here that you should be really excited about. The other thing is the eschatological, and this would be number four, the eschatological study here um, is so important. Uh, Got to be one of the purposes that God give, gave to us, the book of Daniel. Daniel goes hand in hand, for instance, with Revelation. Without Revelation, Daniel would be difficult. Without Daniel, Revelation would be difficult. You can't separate the two. Uh, God has given a certain amount of Revelation here with Daniel. He picks it up in Revelation with John, and we start to put some things together and hopefully piece together most of what we need to know. And in fact, everything that we need to know. When we approach the book of Daniel, we look at a man who is... Um, a really exceptional person. He's one of the greatest servants of God in all of history. Uh, his name meant uh, either God is my judge or God is judge, depending on how you, you work the Hebrew there. But three times he has been referred to as the beloved one. Only good things are said about Daniel. And one of the things that stands out to me is when I think of Daniel, and I think of the revelation that he receives. Isn't it amazing when you think of the person who receives the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament? Who was that? John. And what was he known for? Yeah, beloved, right? I mean, he's, he's loved by God. And there's nothing bad that you can say about John that I'm aware of. I mean, John is an amazing person. He was part of that inner three, Peter, James, and uh, John. And you have, um, with with John and you have with, with Daniel, the opportunity for them to receive these words from God is of highest honor, highest honor. Uh, when we get to heaven, you want to seek out Daniel. Just saying, okay? <laughs> seek him out. You, you want to be friends with Daniel. I'm just saying. Uh, this man is, is an exceptional, exceptional man. Uh, the more you study Daniel's life, and he's spoken of several other times in the Bible, but the more you study his life, you're really, really impressed. Here's a man who's really walking with God, and it really is no shock when you realize that, that God singled him out and said, he's my servant who I'm going to give this information to, this vital information, this imperative information, this information that is so key so that the church of Christ today in 2016 is still studying it and passionate about it. Oh, Daniel's your stuff. Tremendous, tremendous man of God. And uh, I probably shouldn't have told you to seek him out until I got a chance to talk to him. 
We don't know a lot about his upbringing, but it's generally believed that he was um, of, of royalty, uh, some type of nobleness there. Um, the Bible speaks to that there in chapter 1 um, when, it, when it talks about uh, his upbringing to a, to a degree. Uh, these were noble youths, uh, the Bible says, um, who were good looking. They showed intelligence in every branch of wisdom, and they're endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge. Uh, he's just a young man at this point in time. But no doubt his parents had instilled in him a great dedication to the Lord in addition to providing a solid education at the time. And just a word of encouragement here, those of you who are raising kids, um, just a, a word of encouragement. Daniel has got a rootedness in him, a deep conviction of what it takes to be pleasing to the Lord as a very young man. Uh, we're talking very young and he is going to go off into a faraway place, and he's going to be called upon uh, to live out his faith. And there's no one there to see it. And that's the amazing part about Daniel. When Daniel has these convictions, they are deep-rooted, and we're going to study that tonight. I mean, they're, they're, they're impressive, okay? I want you to remember, he's a youngster. He's just a kid. You say, well, oh, kids will be kids. They have adolescence, and they're goofing off, and they're wasting years. And I'll tell you, not everybody in the past has always done that. Daniel is a man who has, has developed a deep conviction, and he lives it out. And it's an inspiration to all of us, and it's a challenge, frankly, to, to me. It's a challenge to you. And, um, you know, we look at Daniel, and we say, man, Lord, help me to have that type of uh, tenaciousness in my faith. So Daniel's uh, an amazing guy. There's five major events in Daniel's life when he's in Babylon. Uh, one, and this is, we'll, we'll get to this one tonight, the refusal to eat the king's food. And then this sustaining power of God, which occurs right after he arrives in Babylon. So it's pretty amazing. Second thing is the revelation about two years later of the meaning of the dream in chapter 2. Chapter 2 is where we'll be next week. The king has a dream, and no one can interpret it. And so Daniel and his cohorts have a little prayer meeting. They ask God, God, will you reveal it to us? And God says, yes, here it is. Major event. Number three, the second interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream is 30 years later. This vision would tell of the king's pending insanity that uh, will actually take place for seven years of his life. And then the reading of the message on the wall during King Belshazzar's feast the night before Persia would come in and capture Babylon. The visit to the lion's den, chapter 6. That, that would make anybody's list, right? I mean, if you were making a list, you know, I mean, greatest things that ever happened to me, I was thrown into a lion's den, and these hungry lions didn't eat me. I mean, that's just, you know, that's a story to talk about, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, that's one I would tell my grandkids. Let me tell you all about that. Wow. Um, the first six chapters of Daniel, like I mentioned earlier, they're going to focus on the historical events in the life of Daniel and his friends, and it's unusual that in this historical section, the language that it is written in is Aramaic and not Hebrew. Okay? And there's reason for that. The reason for the use of Aramaic um, is best seen in terms of the subject matter of the section where it's found. The material deals with matters pertaining to the Gentile world with little notice of God's people, the Jews. And apparently God saw that the Aramaic, the language of the Gentile world of the day, was more suitable than was the Hebrew. So it extends from chapter 2, verse 4, all the way through chapter 7 and verse 28, and then it shifts back to Hebrew. And I find that to be fascinating in itself, because you have God saying to the people, the pagans of the day, this is what's going to happen. He talks about world empires. He predicts what's going to happen with these world empires, which in itself is amazing. If, if I predicted to you the weather for tomorrow and got it right, that would be fairly amazing, right? I mean, the weathermen don't do that half of the time. Did you guys get a thunderstorm today? I mean, there were severe thunderstorms around today. I mean, I never heard of that. I got up this morning and thought it was going to be sunny all day, right? Um, but you, can you imagine predicting What's going to happen in Russia hundreds of years from now? And get it right. What's going to happen in the United States? And get it right. I mean, right down to the details. I mean, this is amazing. Who's going to crush who? Who's going to take care of this? Who's going to be judging this nation? 
And this is the revelation that comes to, to Daniel, which is pretty significant. And these are the Gentile nations that he's speaking about. So when we get into the dream next week, we're going to be dealing with these Gentile nations. After chapter 7, verse 28, you get into the Hebrew because now things are shifting and it becomes about Israel. It becomes about Israel's future, about some of the promises and some of the perils uh, that they're going to face. And so there's some challenges there uh, for the people of Israel. Important to, to note all that. Now the next section here is the historical background. What I want you to do is just hold on to that for a second and flip the page over there and go to the training of Daniel in Babylon. The bringing of Daniel to Babylon verses 1 through 3. And just look here with me at this chronology. We notice here in the very beginning it talks about the third year of Jehoiakim. That's 605 B.C. Daniel 1.1. Um, if you're studying and you came across Jeremiah's reference in 46.2 that the date is the fourth year of Jehoiakim, there's a reason for that discrepancy. I'm not going to go into it to great degrees, but they just ran off of different calendars, which actually started in different times of the year. And that's the reason for that. No big mystery uh, at all. We have here, though, the defeat of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Daniel is in the very beginning. How does he work his way all the way across to Babylon? How does he end up way over there? Well, there's a lot of history uh, as to some of the battles and some of the, the things that are going on during the day. And there was, um, you can take notes if you want to, there, there were the chronicles of the Chaldean kings that became available in 1956. There was an author uh, by the name of Wiseman who uh, published this work that basically was kind of built off of a discovery of a lot of books that were written or scrolls that were discovered. And, and these texts were never published previously. And they cover the years going back to 626 BC through 595 and 556 B.C. going through 539 B.C. So stop and think about this with me as, as we kind of go through this because there's some interesting information here um, that uh, I, I think we should kind of carry with us in, in our minds. When we think of Assyria, we think again, what's the capital of Assyria? Nineveh. See, everybody knows it now. That's good. And if I put Nineveh here, is that right? This is Jerusalem. Farther north, east, 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 there you go. And what river is it on? You guys are good. And that must mean that this is the... Ah, see that? That's amazing. All right. 612 B.C., what happens in Nineveh? They're overtaken, and then there's the fall of Nineveh. Nineveh is representing here the nation of the Assyrians, right? And who knocks off the Assyrians? <laughs> you guys got it all right. Babylonia, the Medes, and really, let me see if I can spell this right. The Scythians. Do you remember those guys when we were preaching about the Scythians a while ago? And teaching about them, they were barbaric. They were some of the nastiest people. These guys are like the baddest of bad. They're like the special ops of nastiness. And so you have Babylonia. So the Babylonians come against the Assyrians. And these guys are all coming against them. And the king, who is there at the time, uh, Asher Ubalat is his name. A-S-S-U-R hyphen U-B-A-L-L-I-T. <laughs> okay. We're going to call him A-B. All right. You with me? He gets ousted here and he goes across and he finds a little city called Haran. And it's there that he's going to live. He makes Haran his headquarters uh, there. 
and it's about 250 miles to the west of Nineveh. So he's gone out there across the Tigris, and he sets up over here. The king of Babylon, who's the king of Babylon? Not yet. Not yet. Nabopolizer. Okay, Nabopolizer, and I'm probably a butcher in these guys' poor names, but they can't do anything about it, right? So, and if you're from New England, it's pa Nebopolassa, okay? He is going to try to take his Babylonian forces, and he's going to try to go out here to Haran to oust them. And he can't do it, uh, and so they kind of just uh, kind of danced for a year. By the time you come to 610 BC, now he's getting serious, and he gets the help of those bad guys again, the Scythians and the Medes, and he comes against them. Now, interesting here is the fact that this uh, king uh, here is going to basically, Asher. Yubalat is going to enlist the help of another nation. What is that other nation? Anybody want to take a guess? Egypt. Believe it or not, Egypt is going to come up. As Egypt comes up, I want you to think of this whole rim. You've got this, this whole rim, and no one passes through here. And so they come up through this area, and you have... A uh, valley that's there called Megiddo. And you think of the Battle of Armageddon, okay? That's where that is. And you have Egypt coming up to reinforce the Assyrians who have been ousted and are pretty much just clinging to life. All right, are you with me? So what's happening here is that eventually, with this combined forces, Nabopolassar is able to oust him and uh, A.B., and the Egyptians who had reinforced Iran, they all flee uh, back across the Euphrates and are no longer really a force anymore. They will unify again in 609, and they will come against Haran, who is now occupied by the Babylonians, and they are defeated, and he goes off into obscurity, and Egypt begins the, the huge power at this point. So now you've got Egypt and you've got Babylon and they are in conflict with each other. They're the two forces that are fighting against each other. Go back with me in your, in your mind and I want you to think of a really good king of Israel. I heard it. Somebody said Josiah. Josiah. Uh, Josiah is actually killed when he goes to Megiddo to try to intercept the Egyptian forces who are trying to come up here to reinforce the Assyrians. He goes out there and he is going to try. And part of the problem for Josiah is the reason that he's doing this is because he's gambling and he's betting on these guys and he's saying these guys are going to be the power and I want them as an ally. And so he went out to fight, and what happened to him in that battle? Do you remember? That's where he died. That's right. And so he is, um, he's killed there. Pharaoh Necho uh, continues on to the north after he wipes out uh, Josiah, and he is going to uh, join up with the Assyrians. But again, nothing good comes out of their battle in 609. And it's at this point that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is getting older, and there is a new young prince who is doing a lot of his battling. And this prince is coming, and he's going up into this area here, and he's extending all the way down into here, and he's trying to take this all for himself. And that prince is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar comes on the rise actually as a general, and he becomes very effective in being able to go down there and rout these forces. Now, there is a huge battle, and I mentioned in 609. The battle is actually in a city 
called, anybody remember? Carchemish. I don't think I'm spelling that right. And that city is right here. The Battle of Carchemish is huge. And after the Assyrians are routed and the Egyptians are routed, it leaves an open highway for Babylon to come all the way across and come down here to Jerusalem. And they are not happy with the people of Jerusalem because the Jews had gone out to fight against Necho, Pharaoh Necho, and were defeated. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't forget that. And so when Nebuchadnezzar comes to Jerusalem, he comes and he lays siege on Jerusalem, and there's no one, including the Lord, that's the most important part, that's going to deliver the people of Israel. Because now it's part of God's plan to allow for the people of Israel to be judged by the Babylonians. And so in 605, in that summer, uh, the Battle of Carchemish, C-A-R-C-H-E-M-I-S, um, takes place. And somewhere in that summer, between that Battle of Carchemish and Nebuchadnezzar returning to take the kingship because uh, Pilaster had died, uh, he goes in there, and that's when these young men are taken prisoner and they are exiled off to Babylon. So that's kind of some of the history uh, behind what is taking place. By the time you come here to, to Daniel and you look at Daniel chapter 1, uh, you're seeing here that uh, Jehoiakim is the vassal king uh, of, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, of Necho, of Pharaoh, and he had been that since 609. And he was actually being carted off to go to Babylon, but for some reason, we don't really know why, he doesn't get carted off and he's able to rule for seven more years. In 604, he is, um, he's going to be doing something really stupid. And it kind of gives you a picture of what's happening uh, spiritually with the people of Israel. Um, I'm going to put my little ribbon here in Daniel chapter 1 and go over to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 36. In Jeremiah chapter 36, starting there in verse 1, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. Now just one point here. He's the oldest son of the godly Josiah, but the people of Israel actually never made him their king. Uh, Jehoahaz uh, was the younger brother, and he had actually been crowned king by the Jews. They actually knew that his character was better than his older brother. Uh, but when Pharaoh Necho came along, Pharaoh Necho said, okay, you're going to work for me and do what I say. And so he appoints Jehoiakim to that office. So here you are in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, and it says um, that the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, take a scroll and write on it all the words which I've spoken to you concerning Israel and concerning Judah and concerning all the nations from the day I first spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. Perhaps the house of Judah will hear all the calamity which I plan to bring on them in order that every man will turn from his evil way and then I'll forgive their iniquity and their sin. Sounds like a pretty nice offer, doesn't it? That's a really great offer. Uh, God's saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do to you, so repent. And, and, and he gives this special revelation here to Jeremiah. And, and what, is the, what is the reaction? Well, they start to tell the people about what is written down uh, as it's come from God. And there in chapter 36, you have the people responding in a very positive way. But the problem begins in verse 20, where they go to the king with this, and the king's in the court, but they had deposited the scroll in the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and they reported all the words to the king. The king sent Jehudai to get the scroll. He took it out of the chamber, and Jehudai read it to the king as well to the officials who stood beside the king. Now, the king was sitting in the winter house uh, in the ninth month with a fire burning in the uh, brazier before him. And when Jehudai had read there uh, three or four columns, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was there in that, uh, that, that kind of a labor of uh, fire pit, as it were, until 
all the scroll was consumed in the fire uh, that was there. So isn't that great? This is who you're dealing with. So Jehoiachin, what a knucklehead. Um, he's thinking to himself, all these terrible things are going to happen if I don't repent. So we don't want to repent. I mean, heaven forbid that we'd repent and God would say, okay, you know, we'll, we'll love each other again. Um, instead, the idea is, no, let's just let's cut this thing up in pieces and burn it. And maybe somehow then we won't be subject to this judgment. Does it make sense to you? It doesn't make sense to me either. That's what you're dealing with. And you're dealing with the people of Israel um, that are, are more tender-hearted towards the Lord uh, than this king. And it's really a shame when you look at um, the legacy of, of Josiah, uh, his father, and, and you see how, how uh, poor this, uh, this truly is. Notice with me here, if you would there, uh, in verse 2, uh, we read this. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, uh, to the house of his God. Uh, when you see the word Lord there in verse 2, uh, the Hebrew name for Lord there is Adonai. It's not Yahweh, or we would translate that Jehovah. Uh, that is only going to occur in chapter 9. There's one reference to Jehovah, uh, Yahweh, again, chapter 9. Adonai speaks of God as the supreme master, and we see the significance of using that title, Adonai, here, is to show that God was the master of this entire situation. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. It's not Nebuchadnezzar's strength. It's not the fact that Nebuchadnezzar is able to defeat the Assyrians and knock back the Egyptians and then come down to Jerusalem and besiege it. It's not that uh, as the reason why Jerusalem has fallen in 586 B.C. The reason Jerusalem falls is because God is in control. And this was what God was doing. He was allowing this to take place, engineering all of these things so that his people, Israel, would repent. But I want you to know this, that what God does before he comes in there and brings this judgment is he allows uh, for the word of God to come to Jeremiah the prophet so that the people have a chance to repent. God is a very patient God, isn't he? It's so amazing to me when you put all these different pieces together. You see how God is engineering all of these different things, and you have this revelation that comes to Jeremiah, and, and the people, you know, they, they want to repent. Uh, they they want to seek the Lord. And you have uh, the, the reaction of the king, and it just cuts down that joyous uh, repentance and that restoration that might have taken place. And you see here that, that God's not doing anything by accident. Uh, God's going to use the Babylonians as part of the chastisement for his people, Israel, because they've been wicked, because they've been sinful. Uh, and I, I look at that and I recognize that, that God is very patient towards us, isn't he? He really is a very, very long-suffering God. Uh, we don't know uh, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, we don't know. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I look at the Bible and I study and I study the end times and I realize that uh, the rapture of the church is going to take place. It's going to take us out of that great tribulation or the tribulation as a whole. Uh, we're not going to be part of that, I don't believe. And uh, that's a wonderful reality. However, I don't know if God doesn't plan to judge the United States of America. Uh, he could do that long before the rapture takes place. Uh, I don't know what his plans are, but I do know he's active, and I knew, know that he's doing things all the time in the world. Uh, he's working in the, 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 the behind the scenes. We don't see what's happening. Uh, by the time we get later into Daniel, uh, we're going to find that uh, there's, a, there's a, a fighting match that's going on in the heavenlies, uh, and Satan is doing his utmost to prevent God from having his plans carried out. Of course, God is always going to be victorious, and he's victorious in Daniel as he is in Revelation. But it isn't true that when we look around, we recognize the plans of God. And we say, God, you have some amazing plans. And we don't know what they all are. We may know that the rapture of the church is going to take place, the next great event. But we don't know what's going to happen in our world, do we? Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in our nation. Uh, we don't know uh, what nations are on the rise and which nations are falling down. 
Understand this, though, that God's in control of all of these things. Uh, God's not surprised that Hillary Clinton uh, and not Bernie Sanders is running against Donald Trump. Uh, he's not surprised by that. Uh, I don't know what that's going to mean uh, if either one of them get in. Uh, we don't know. But we know that God has plans. We know that God is working these things out. And it's, it, it's just amazing to, uh, to stop and think about. Well, there they are. Um, we have this King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, coming against the people of Israel. And we find that at this point in time, the king has ordered uh, his servant there, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. And this is where we start to see Daniel. and We start to see some of the things that uh, are, are going to be identifying factors in his character and, and his life. And so as you look at this with me, um, we recognize that the captivity of Judah begins there in verse 3 um, when this is happening. It says, including some of the royal family and the nobles. Uh, he takes these young people, and he is going to find the most uh, significant young people, the, the ones with more understanding and discernment and knowledge. And he's going to handpick these people and take them back to Babylon. And the king appoints for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that day uh, should be educated for three years and at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. So here's what the king is doing. He's taking these young men who are young, 13 to 15 in age. They're physically fit. There's no illnesses. Uh, they're intelligent. They're eager to learn. And he's taking them uh, and training them for three years learning the Chaldeans' way of life, learning the language of Babylon, uh, not Syrian, but Aramaic, and he is going to provide for them a special diet of food uh, for three years. He's going to do all of these things for them. We know, as we read the scriptures there, in verse 6, their names were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel, he assigned the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, and then Meshach, and Abednego. And so we have these huge name changes. I want you to think with me what it must have been like for a young man, 13 to 15 years of age, to be transported from here to here via this route, okay? And end up way over there. And then they're going to change your name. And your name is going to be representing the pagan gods of that nation. I wonder if they called themselves their Hebrew names when they were alone. I'll bet you they did. Daniel's name was God is my judge. It's changed to Belshazzar, which means literally Bell's prince. False god. Hananiah. His name means Yahweh is gracious. They changed it to Shadrach, which means either, and there's some divergence here, I am very faith fearful, or he is named after Aku, a false god. Mishael, who is as God, his name means, changes it to Meshach, who is what Aku is, is what that means. It's like, who is our great God? Azariah, Yahweh has helped, is changed to Abednego, which means a servant of Nebo. How would you like to have your names changed? That'd be disheartening, wouldn't it? You're 13 to 15 years old. You're going to live for quite a while. I mean, Dan Daniel's going to live into his 80s, um, and he's going to have, you know, Belshazzar <laughs> is his name. Here these men are, and they're put in a difficult situation. The Bible says that the king appointed to them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years. And at the end of that, they're going to enter the king's personal service. So they are given, and literally the Hebrew there is speaking of this is the king's actual food. This is the exact food that the king ate. So if the king was having, uh, you know, lobster and mac and cheese, that's what they ate, right? 
and uh, whatever he was drinking, they were drinking. This was, this was the best of the best. And when you were a king, you, we might think we eat like kings. I think I eat like a king, don't you? I mean, this is great. Um, but these kings really had anything and everything in their realm at their disposal. And they were eating the very, very best. And when you looked at people, there were people in their kingdom that no doubt were gaunt and, and thin and unhealthy because their diets were very, very poor. And when you looked at the king, you saw a robust individual. Maybe he was a little overweight because it was thought of to be good if you were overweight. Um, you were healthy. You were wealthy. Uh, and so, you know, that's what he wants for these young men. He wants the same thing. So he's going to give them the food to eat. I want you to stop and think with me what it'd be like for you when you were 13 to 15 years old and you were taken far away and the king came to you and said, this is what I want you to eat. Why did Daniel and his three friends have a problem with the food that the king was setting before them? They were Jewish, that's true. And these were probably the first thing, probably unclean food. Probably unclean food. Uh, and they knew the difference. But hey, you're 13 years old. You're far away from home. Who's going to know? Who seriously is going to know? And you think to yourself, yes, God knows. And it's true. And they had an awareness of God, which is, which is really rare in a lot of situations. Here these young men are, and they're taking a stand. They're taking a stand. I, I remember when I was in high school, I was on one of those student exchange trips. What a, what a anyway. <laughs> so they took us all to New York City from my high school. There were, I don't know, maybe four of us. And we went to New York City. And uh, back in the 70s, New York City was a pretty rough place. I'm sure it's improved a lot since. I mean, I saw kids from my high school, my three people that went with me, I didn't know them from Adam, but I saw them do things that they would have never done at home. And I know that they had pretty serious regrets and some things carried over into their life for quite a long time after that. There were decisions that were made that were mind-boggling to me. Um, it was like, well, we're far away from Cape Cod and we'll do whatever we want to do. And they did. And it was amazing. I remember this one girl, and she was just a, just really a straight-laced kid, you know. I mean, she, you know, was pretty serious and studied and all that kind of stuff. And I was just kind of a goof, and, um, you know, I, I couldn't relate to her at all. I thought, you know, she's, ooh, you know. Um, but, but, man, I saw the stuff that she was doing and the drugs and all the stuff, and I thought to myself, wow, I just can't believe it. And, and that's why I think about Daniel. I think about these three young men. It's like their, their mother's not there. Their father's not there. Uh, th there's no rabbis around. There's, there's nothing. What? Just eat this food. But if some of it was unclean, they knew they were violating God's word. They knew that it would become a, an issue. And the other side of it, too, is these rations that the king had would normally have been offered to Babylonian gods, pagan gods first. And they would do that so that they could offer them to the gods and have that food blessed and then their strength that would come from that food would be a credit to those false gods. And so because of that, Daniel did not want to give glory to those pagan uh, deities, uh, those false gods, in any way, shape, or form. He wanted to hold his ground. And so this is what he does. I mean, check this out. You're starting to get a feel for, for who this Daniel is. Daniel makes up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food, and uh, he's going to uh, seek out this... Uh, this individual who's in charge of it all. And he says, um, now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking haggard uh, more so than the youths who are your own age? Uh, then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
Let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this manner and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who were eating the king's choice food. So here you have a miracle that takes place. Uh, I don't know how much weight you can lose or gain in just 10 days. Uh, it's a very short period of time, really, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know that much about it. But one thing I do know is that just on vegetables and just on water, not having a huge caloric intake, uh, this could only be attributed to God. It is God who is doing this work. And so after the 10 days, uh, you know, these kids are walking around, they're, they're loosening their belts, you know. I mean, I, <clears throat> man, I'm gaining weight like crazy, Lord. And, uh, the, the, and, the, and the, the eunuch who's in charge, this official, is looking at him and saying, whoa, this is truly amazing. And here's these four that won't eat the king's food and drink the king's wine, and yet they're the ones who are looking more plump than the others who are eating all that high-calorie food. And you have Daniel who's taken a stand, and not to diminish his three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, uh, these are, are people who are given pagan names, but they're living out their faith in God. And they could change the name on the outside, but you couldn't change their hearts. And that, to me, is just tremendous. It's just tremendous. The character of these young men is absolutely amazing. So we notice here that uh, these young men are going to be uh, useful to the Lord in all of these things. Um, the Bible says that the overseer continued then after he saw what was going on uh, to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink, and they kept giving them vegetables. And as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. And Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. So it's a unique gifting that God has given to his servant for this particular purpose. At the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them. The commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. And as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better. Do you get that? Ten times better than all the magicians and all the conjurers who were in his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. And that pushes this out a very long time. And so Daniel is, is going to resolve not to, to defile himself. And then you look at what happens. There's physical blessing. It's noticeable what's happening to him. And then there's the intellectual blessing there in verse 17, uh, where there's wisdom and there's knowledge. Uh, and the ability then to even understand uh, visions and dreams. Understand this, that that is God who is giving him that. God is doing this for Daniel. And then there's the political blessing, ten times better. And then Daniel is going to stand before the king and be involved in the king's service. Daniel's uh, going to continue through to uh, Cyrus the king. It's pretty amazing how many kings come and go while Daniel is still there. Uh, but you're going to roll through Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and Belshazzar. I mean, it's just uh, amazing. Uh, they come, they go. But Daniel is standing the test of time because God had his hand on him in a very special way. When we get to chapter 2, the king has a dream. And who in the world is going to be able to interpret that dream? Uh, well, we know it's going to be Daniel, right? And it gives us some uh, history. Uh, there are some kingdoms here that are being presented. And it's, uh, it, it's going to be fun to see how those work out. We're going to take a little side trip over to Zechariah uh, and see what God says over there. God is doing just amazing things. Um, when you look at what God has done and you look at what God's going to do, um, it, it's pretty substantial. It's pretty amazing. I'm looking forward to it. This was an introduction lesson. Hopefully you stayed awake here tonight. Uh, as we went through some of this history, um, and it was helpful to you. Any, anyone have a question that I can't answer? <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. Let's have a word of prayer uh, before we go. Father, how we rejoice in the things that you have done. 
uh, in the past, Lord, working through uh, Daniel's life and the lives of uh, these three young men that were there transported to a far country. Lord, uh, how we admire their, just their tenaciousness uh, to cling to the principles and truths that they were taught as youngsters. Father, give us the same desire to be pleasing to you. And Father, even when we think to ourselves, no one will notice, Lord, help us to remember that you notice because you see all things. May you just bless, Lord, as we continue our study. May it be an encouragement, Father, to each one of us as we not only look at the history and not only the prophecy, but also interwoven into all of Daniel, these spiritual lessons. How we thank you, Father, for your work among us. Bless us, Lord. Give us uh, safety as we go our separate ways here tonight. Uh, may we live for you in a victorious way this week, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.